In today's video, we'll be exploring the anatomy of the scapula, also known as the shoulder blade. This bone plays a crucial role in the mobility and stability of the shoulder joint. The scapula is a flat, triangular bone located at the back of the chest. It helps form the shoulder joint by articulating with the humerus at the glenoid cavity and the clavicle at the acromioclavicular joint. It's supported from above by the trapezius muscle and held against the chest wall by the serratus anterior muscle. The scapula has three borders, medial, lateral, superior, and it has three angles, superior, inferior, and lateral. The scapula has two surfaces, the anterior or coastal surface and the posterior or dorsal surface. And it has three bony projections or processes, spine of the scapula at the back, a chromion process, and the coracoid process. Let's talk more on the borders of the scapula. Superior border, which is the shortest of the three, it contains an important feature known as the suprascapular notch, through which the suprascapular nerve passes. The lateral border is the thickest of the borders. It features the infraglenoid tubercle, a small projection where the long head of the triceps brachii muscle attaches. The medial border is the thinnest. It provides attachment sites for several muscles, including the serratus anterior, rhomboids, and levator scapulae which are essential for the movement and stabilization of the scapula. The angles of the scapula correspond to specific landmarks on the rib cage. The superior angle is at the level of the second rib, the inferior angle aligns with the seventh rib, and the lateral angle features the glenoid cavity, which articulates with the humerus to form the shoulder joint. Let's now talk about the three bony projections of the scapula. The spinous process is a bony projection that divides the dorsal surface of the scapula into the supraspinous and infraspinous fossae. The acromion process projects forward from the spine and overhangs the glenoid cavity, providing an attachment point for muscles and ligaments. The coracoid process projects forward and laterally, serving as an attachment site for the short head of the biceps coracobrachialis, pectoralis minor, and several ligaments, contributing to shoulder stability and movement. Scapula got two surfaces, coastal or anterior surface, and dorsal or posterior surface. Its costal surface is concave forward and features bony ridges for the attachment of subscapularis muscle. The serratus anterior muscle attaches along its medial border and inferior angle. Its dorsal surface is convex and features a spinous process that divides it into the smaller supraspinous fossa and the larger infraspinous fossa. The spinoglenoid notch allows for the passage of nerves and vessels between these fossae. The scapula has several key bony articulations that contribute to shoulder function. First, the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint forms between the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus, acting as a ball and socket joint that enables a wide range of motion. The acromioclavicular joint connects the acromion of the scapula to the lateral end of the clavicle, functioning as a synovial plane joint that allows for gliding movements. To determine the side of the scapula, hold it so that the glenoid cavity faces laterally and forward. Ensure the coracoid process points forward and the spinous process extends posteriorly. The scapula serves as an attachment point for up to 17 muscles. Among these, four muscles make up the rotator cuff, which plays a crucial role in supporting the shoulder joint and reinforcing the joint capsule. The supraspinatus arises from the supraspinous fossa, while the infraspinatus originates from the infraspinous fossa, both located on the posterior surface of the scapula. The teres minor takes its origin from the lateral border of the scapula 
and the subscapularis comes from the subscapular fossa on the anterior surface. Let's explore more muscles attached to the scapula. The teres major muscle originates from the lateral border of the scapula, just below the teres minor, and is responsible for medial rotation and adduction of the arm. The latissimus dorsi, a large broad-like muscle of originating from the lower back, has a small attachment on the inferior angle of the scapula. It inserts into the intertubercular groove of the humerus, contributing to arm extension, adduction, and internal rotation. Now let's look at the muscles attached to the medial margin of the scapula, both on the costal and dorsal surfaces. The levator scapulae inserts into the superior aspect of the medial border on the dorsal surface of the scapula and is responsible for elevating the scapula. The rhomboid minor is a thin sheet of muscle which inserts on the medial border of the scapula at the level of the spine and is responsible for retracting and elevating the scapula. The rhomboid major inserts on the medial border of the scapula just below the spine and functions to retract and elevate the scapula. The serratus anterior muscle inserts along the costal surface of the medial border of the scapula, running deep to the scapula itself, and is crucial for protracting the scapula, keeping it flat against the thoracic wall. It also plays a key role in upward rotation of the scapula. Let's look at some more muscles attached to the lateral aspect of the scapula and the coracoid process now. The coracobrachialis muscle originates from the tip of the coracoid process of the scapula and inserts onto the medial surface of the humerus. The short head of the biceps also originates from the tip of the coracoid process along with the coracobrachialis muscle. The long head of the biceps brachii originates from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula and plays a key role in flexing the elbow and supinating the forearm. The long head of the triceps originates from the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. Let's now have a look from the posterior aspect. You can now see all the muscular attachment near the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Let's now take a closer look at two important muscles attached to the spine of the scapula, the trapezius and the deltoid. The lower fibers attached to the medial end of the spine of the scapula, assisting in the depression and upward rotation of the scapula. The middle fibers attached to the spine of the scapula, primarily responsible for retracting the scapula towards the spine. The upper fibers insert into the lateral third of the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula. The deltoid is a large triangular muscle covering the shoulder joint, responsible for a wide range of arm movements. It is primarily responsible for shoulder abduction, particularly the middle fibers, which are most active when the arm is raised to the side. The anterior fibers assist in flexion and internal rotation, while the posterior fibers contribute to extension and external rotation of the shoulder. The deltoid muscle has three distinct origins. Posterior fibers start from the spine of the scapula. The middle fibers originate from the acromion of the scapula. The anterior fibers arise from the lateral third of the clavicle, Let's conclude our discussion on the muscles connected to the scapula with the omohyoid muscle, a long, slender muscle extending from the neck to the scapula. As an infrahyoid muscle, it consists of two bellies connected by a muscular tendon. The superior belly arises from the hyoid bone, while the inferior belly originates from the superior border of the scapula. The scapula forms through ossification from eight centers, one primary in the body and seven secondary. The primary center and the initial secondary center in the coracoid process develop by the eighth week of gestation and the first year after birth, respectively, and fuse by age 15. The remaining secondary centers emerge around puberty and fuse by age 20. 
There is a rich arterial anastomotic network around the scapula formed by the branches of the first part of the subclavian artery and the third part of the axillary artery. Key contributors include the suprascapular artery and dorsal scapular artery from the subclavian artery, along with the circumflex scapular artery from the axillary artery. This extensive network ensures adequate blood supply and collateral circulation to the muscles and tissues surrounding the scapula. The two nerves worth mentioning around the scapula are the suprascapular nerve and the axillary nerve. The suprascapular nerve originates from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus and descends laterally, passing through the suprascapular notch beneath the superior transverse scapular ligament. It innervate the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. The axillary nerve arises from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and courses posteriorly. Scapula fractures are relatively uncommon injuries, accounting for less than 1% of all fractures. Given the scapula's protected position by surrounding muscles, these fractures typically result from high-energy trauma, such as motor vehicle accidents. It is often associated with clavicular fractures, as shown in the image. Winging scapula is a condition characterized by the medial border of the scapula protruding outward from the chest wall, giving it a wing-like appearance. Due to paralysis of the serratus anterior muscle, which is responsible for keeping the medial border of the scapula pushed against the chest wall. Often caused by injury to the long thoracic nerve, this condition is most noticeable when the patient presses their hands against a wall as the scapula stands out prominently. That wraps up our look at the anatomy of scapula. I hope you found this breakdown helpful and informative. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more anatomy insights.